Back in the far off year of 2020, when I first started this channel, one of the first games that I played was Lichdom Battle Mage. It was a game I'd always been very curious about, but despite my best efforts, I never could really get into it, and eventually I'd move on to other projects. I never did forget it, though. It was always sitting in the back of my mind as a nagging thought that I should really go back and finish it one of these days. Well, today we're doing exactly that. I'll be playing through the entire main story, a decent bit of the side content, and even a little bit of the post-game to see if I can figure out why I was never able to forget this game, and determine if it's an overlooked gem or just a bad game with some good ideas. So what kind of game is Battle Mage? To break it down to its base parts, it's a magic-based first-person shooter with some light RPG elements. Each of the game's eight levels consists of a series of arenas, where you fight your way through waves of enemies before proceeding on until you eventually hit a boss. In between each arena, you'll find save points, story flashbacks, and some optional challenges, and there are gates set up at certain points that don't don't open until you've dealt with all the enemies behind you. Your character moves at a determined strut, unless you're moving backwards, in which case it's more of a timid step, though you do have the ability to sprint and teleport a short distance. Both of those tools are necessary for survival since enemies tend to be faster than you, so you'll be getting very familiar with both of them if you decide to give the game a try yourself. Between the way you move and the gated progressions, levels can feel like a slog to get through, especially some of the later ones that can last for two to three hours on an average playthrough. It's not all bad, though. The environment design in the game is genuinely impressive in many places, and it's probably the best part of the game, and certainly the most creative. The journey may start in a generic medieval city, but later you'll find yourself traveling through a forgotten desert oasis, or the remains of a massive magical weapon from some long, distant war. And at that point, all the sluggish movement stops mattering because you really want to see where you're going next. Of course, no journey is complete without something to challenge you along the way. And on Unfortunately, here is one of the places I think Battle Mage stumbles the most. There are three factions of enemies you'll encounter along your journey, which is a little misleading to say because it's really only one faction with a few different models and slight variations. You have the basic melee grunts, whose only goal in life is to run towards you slowly and give you some easy targets. Then there is the slightly stronger melee enemies, who also exist to run towards you slowly and occasionally sneak up and shave off a bit of your health. A couple different ranged enemies get introduced to split your attention from the melee enemies, and lastly you have casters, who exist purely to make your life miserable. Each faction gets an enemy type or two mostly unique to them, but that usually translates to acting similarly to one of the other types, but with a special ability or two added in. For example, the undead get a banshee type enemy that can scream to freeze you in place for a bit, and also raise other enemies to fight. The cultists have a guy who I think has a ranged attack, but I mostly just remember him teleporting around and dying before before doing much of anything. The demons, being the enemies that take a few missions to get a proper introduction, trade the basic melee grunt for an enemy with not much health, but lightning bolts that I think are hit scan. There are also some unique bosses at the end of each mission, though most of them end up as recurring enemies as you get close to the end of the game. The majority are large, slow damage sponges that don't add too much to the mix, so they end up not leaving much of an impression. In an attempt to mix things up and keep the fights challenging throughout the game, these these enemies can also spawn in with modifiers. Some of them are fairly self-explanatory, like freezing and knockdown, which do exactly what they say on the tin. Lieutenant enemies have boosted health and damage, colossal health enemies have their health pool boosted to a frankly absurd degree, seething enemies deal rapid burn damage and an aura around them, and I'm pretty sure cursed enemies do something, but I never really been able to figure out what it is. Individually, none of these effects are too much of a problem, and even in most combinations they're pretty manageable. There's one modifier that's an exception to that, and that's godlike. Godlike enemies have boosted health and damage, and shield the enemies around them, so you have to deal with them first. Early on it's not too much of an issue, but by the end of the game they become so common, I started dreading every encounter. Fortunately, all the visual tells for the abilities are pretty easy to read, as the enemies have the modifier in text above their heads, and most of them have very obvious added effects, so they'll rarely take you by surprise. Overall, I feel like the modifiers do a fine job of keeping things interesting. Seething ended up being the most interesting of the bunch, because having enemies that deal rapid damage when they get close to you forced me to change my approach to the fights where it showed up. With the enemies out of the way, what options do we have to fight them? As the second half of the title might give away, the main character is a battle mage. And not just any battle mage, but one who can cast spells for free, with a bit of a caveat. The game doesn't have anything like cooldowns or a mana system, but you can charge your spells to guarantee a critical
critical hit. You can also roll crits randomly, but in my experience it happens so infrequently that you're better off just charging your spells and not leaving it to chance. Each spell is made up of a sigil, a shape, and an attunement, and there are nine sigils in total and three different attunements. On paper, you might think that this, this makes for a spell system with an unparalleled amount of flexibility, especially when you consider that higher level spells can have up to five attunements on them. Of course, that's just on paper, but hold on to that thought for a bit. We'll come back to it. The attunement of the spell determines its effect. Destruction spells deal damage, control spells inflict some sort of crowd control that can remove things from a fight temporarily, and mastery spells add a stacking debuff that increases the damage that the next critical hit deals. And that little detail right there is exactly why the system is not nearly as flexible as it looks at first glance. The gulf between how much damage a control spell can allow your next crit to deal, and how much a mastery spell can is so large that I can't imagine actually playing through the game using control spells anymore. It feels to me that the game just wasn't designed or tested with that in mind. Now that being said, you can find attunements and shapes from the game's chest stand-ins, as drops from enemies, and as a reward from any of the optional challenges that you manage to complete. The shapes determine how a spell behaves, whether it's a bolt or a beam or a pool of magic that just sits there while enemies walk through it, for example. And they determine how many attunement slots are available. While none of the shapes are inherently better than the others, you'll quickly develop a personal preference based on your playstyle. For me personally, I use bolt spells exclusively. You can also upgrade shapes and attunements by combining three of the same rarity and type together, which is how you get access to stronger spells before similar parts start dropping for you. Besides the environment design, the sigils are the place where it feels that the team really let their creativity run wild. You start the game with fire, ice, and shield. Fire's the most straightforward, it just deals a lot of damage, and can deal damage over time with the control attunement. Ice control can freeze enemies in place and also deals a fair bit of damage. And, of course, your shield is your health. There are separate attunements for shield that correspond to light, medium, and heavy armor. They each have their advantages and drawbacks, but if you decide to give this game a try, let me make a recommendation. Go for the heaviest armor you can. A lot of the fights can get very hectic, and you don't want to get sent back to the last checkpoint just because a demon or a cultist got a lucky hit in. As you progress through the story, you unlock a further six sigils. Kinesis is my second favorite. Most forms of it lock an enemy in place for several seconds, seconds, which makes it invaluable for creating some breathing room in tough fights. Necromancy, my personal favorite, doesn't do a ton on its own, but if you tag an enemy with a necromancy spell and then kill it with a crit, it rises as a friendly undead. There are no limits to the number of undead you can summon while you're in combat, but only three of them will carry over with you to the next fight. This one's a lifesaver, and at this point I really couldn't imagine trying to play through the game without it. The Lightning Sigil trades raw damage for the ability to chain to multiple enemies. Phase deals some damage and teleports enemies that got hit. You can also store damage you throw into certain spells, so there might be some really interesting tricks you can pull off with it. Delirium temporarily charges enemies, making them fight for you. If I ever play through the game again, I might give this one a proper try to see how it works. And finally, there's Corruption, which is the strangest one. All of its effects deal with parasites, though whether that's th damage over time or summoning an allied parasite depends entirely on the attunement. I've tried it in the past, but it's a little too finicky for my personal tastes. It's exactly the kind of thing that it's going to appeal to a very particular kind of player, and I'm sure there are a couple people out there who will absolutely love it. While the magic system is a lot to take in all at once, there are still a couple other aspects to cover. Blinking isn't the only defensive magic you have. You can also block attacks. Blocking normally reduces the damage a bit, which can be the difference between a shield pip breaking and holding off long enough to recharge. If you're using the right type of armor, and you manage to time your block correctly, you'll perform a Nova. They apply a variety of effects depending on their attunement, but honestly I didn't use them that much. The timing is very tight, and if you mistime it you're more than likely just to lose a shield pip for the trouble. The most important part of the magic system, of course, is your inventory. As I mentioned previously, you find shapes and a 
attunements out in the world that you can use to craft your spells. Pick a sigil, pick a shape, assign the attunements, and then hope that whatever you've made is better than what you currently have equipped. When I would play in the past, this is always the part that I would stumble at. With the custom inventory setting, there is so much micromanagement of the spells that I would always give up and end up underpowered for the part of the game I was in. If you are the kind of person to whom that kind of very granular optimization sounds like fun, you're going to have a great time with the custom inventory system. For me personally, I prefer the smart inventory alternative that handles everything for you. All you need to do is make sure that each spell has the right shape and attunement, and the game will alert you when you can upgrade it to a stronger version. It even handles the upgrading for you, though that does cause some friction with what I would consider the most interesting system in the game. If you're anything like me, seeing the variety of sigils got you wondering what would happen happen if you combined them. Around halfway through the fourth mission, the game gives you the answer to that question. When you upgrade a legendary shape, you can either turn it into a powerful, non-unique shape, or into one of the unique shapes that combines the effects of two sigils into one spell. Most sigil combinations are represented, though you won't get to see them all in a single playthrough without a ton of grinding. For my journey, I used the fire and kinesis combo that dropped a high damage meteor on the target, and also the fire and necromancy combo that creates an exploding skeleton. I call him Bob. These spells to charge whenever you kill an enemy with a critical spell from either sigil, with a bonus if the enemy was affected by both before they died. This means that while you can't exactly spam them, they'll be up at least once per fight if not more. And these spells do a lot of damage, and have some pretty unique effects, so they're worth building around if you find a pairing or two that you like. With that, we've finally covered how the game actually works. More or less, it is a very complex, set of systems that, when actually put into play, don't feel as complicated as they are. Which, of course, means that it's time to talk about the story. Given that this game is an RPG, I do feel that the story is an important part of the package, so if you'd like to give the game a try yourself, and you don't want any spoilers, this is probably a good time to hop off. For the rest of us, let's carry on. At its heart, Lichdom Battle Mage is a story about revenge. You start by picking one of two characters to play as, and are treated to a graphic novel style cutscene showing how that character's life got ruined. I chose to play as the male character for this playthrough, who's a blacksmith whose wife was killed by the evil Count Shax before he got knocked out by a blow to the head. We wake up some time later to find that a man named Roth has given us a pair of enchanted bracers that allow us to do all of the fancy magic stuff we're about to spend the next 14 hours or so doing. Turns out that Count Shax and the Cult of Malthus cast a spell that put the whole city of Dravasir to sleep. A powerful artifact known as a relic Aquary can break the spell, so we get a bit of a tutorial while we walk to where one is. Along the way, we figured out that the reliquaries were left by Roth for his dragons, which we are now one of, but the cult has corrupted them to their own ends. It's a decent hook for the plot that unfortunately falls into a common trap for fantasy writing. We as the audience know nothing about how this world works, or any of the details about it, but the characters do already. The story really needs someone to ask the questions that would help establish the background information we need to understand the setting so that a torrent of proper nouns like this isn't confusing for the audience. The opening minutes of the game raise so many questions that, for the most part, kind of go unanswered. Questions like, is the cult well known, or are they a secret organization? What kind of place is Dravasser? Why is the moon broken? I imagine someone out there, probably the story team from the original game, has the answers to all those questions in exhaustive detail, but even having played through the game myself, I can only hazard a guess at the answers. Those being actually most of the world's population, 1600s London, and because the cult blew it up, respectively. After getting killed by a demon, we fight some undead that burst through a fountain and head down into the old city that the new city was built on top of. Shax's lackey, who killed our wife, is down there, but he's using the fast travel system we haven't unlocked yet to escape. Hunting him down leads us through the ruins of old Dravasser and the massive trees that reclaimed it. And here's where the game introduces two of the strongest parts of the story, in my mind. We start finding flashbacks points that show events that happened at some point in the past. The majority focus on the Twelfth Dragon, who would have been the one before us. She doesn't seem to be around anymore, though, 
so we'll need to follow her trail and figure out what happened. Getting this glimpse of the past not only gives us a glimpse into the world that I desperately wanted, but the Twelfth Dragon and her partner that get introduced later easily have the best voice acting in the game. About a third of the way through the mission, we're introduced to the other protagonist that we didn't choose. They're serving as our partner for the journey, simply known as the Griffin to our dragon. In this case, she has a really fun introduction that sets the tone for the two protagonists' relationship perfectly. After fighting through the old city, we catch up to Shax's lackey at the device the cult is using to put the people to sleep. He's joined by a demon, and the fight is actually fairly tough. It serves as a good example for why mastery spells are so important. And after we bearing both the lackey and the demon down, we head off to the Grey Teeth Mountains to deal with Shax himself. The mountain level is a long trek through the wilderness to Shax's hunting lodge. This mission is where the game comes up with the most stereotypically dark fantasy excuse for why there aren't any neutral NPCs hanging around. The cult, it turns out, likes to hunt people for sport, and they get very enthusiastic about their sports. It's kind of a brilliant excuse in the bleakest way possible. Overall, not much happens plot-wise in this mission, or the next one. After Shax's hunting lodge lives up to expectations, he pits us against what I would consider the worst enemy in the game. The large tentacle demons have exactly two attacks. They blink towards you several times, and hit you for what is often at least a third of your health, and they launch a series of tracking projectiles that don't do much damage, but reduce your speed to almost zero for slightly longer than they need to hit you. And they always follow that attack up with the teleporting. That means most of the time this enemy can kill you in three hits that you won't be able to dodge, and they are everywhere in the last couple missions. I honestly believe this game would be improved dramatically if this one enemy were removed. But we're not here for me to screech about poorly designed demons, we have a count to hunt down. Under the lodge is an entrance to a massive cave that leads to a breathtaking glacier with a fleet frozen inside of it. Naturally, at the bottom of the glacier is another reliquary and a giant enemy crab. By this point, I'd invested enough into necromancy that my minions were able to distract it the whole time. Shax gets crushed by some falling debris, but given that we still have over half the game left, I doubt he'll be staying down for long. Our victory is immediately followed by a jarring transition to the royal palace in Dravasar, where we overhear that the king is actually the leader of the cult, and Shax was just a pawn. Of course, we arrive just too late to save the archbishop, and I hope you can see why I have a problem with how this game tells its story. We find out there's an archbishop 30 seconds before he dies. We find out there's a church in this world 30 seconds before it stops being relevant to the story at all. But with the archbishop dead, Roth transfers his soul into his body. This goes mostly uncommented on, since there's no time to waste. But between this and an earlier conversation about the cult of Malthus, I was ready to put good money on Roth actually being Malthus, trying to stop the people using his legacy for evil. Unfortunately, that's never confirmed by the game, so that'll just have to remain my pet theory. At this point, most of our leads have hit a dead end, so the only guidance we have left is to follow the trail of the previous dragon to the desert kingdom of Zasad. That seems to be where the undead are coming from, and it happens to also be where Shax's children live. The twins are... Something special. Which is to say that this game is a dark fantasy story that was released after the Game of Thrones TV show started airing. So I think that's all that needs to be said about that. Like the Great Teeth Mountains, Zasad is a great example of how good environment design can be used to elevate a common setting. On the surface, it's the obligatory desert level, but that desert is actually made up of a network of towns, caves, and canyons that keep things varied. Parts of the level were clearly inspired by the real-life wonder of the world Petra, with structures being cut from the canyon walls. After fighting through hordes of the undead, we make it to the twins' palace in the heart of the oasis. Like the glacier from the previous mission, it's a breathtaking bit of work that really shows what this team was capable of. The palace also holds the machine that's been redirecting the water from the surrounding region here, and after shutting it down, we pursue the twins deeper into the desert. As we pursue the twins through the countless tombs and ruins that make up Lost Zasad, we see a flashback telling us that the cult's home base is a place 
place called Soddentrod. It's become clear at this point that the Twelfth Dragon failed in her mission, which she probably didn't survive. Though we don't really know what happened just yet. Honestly, by this point in the game, answering that question was one of the things that was really keeping me invested. One of the writer's biggest strengths has been characterization. The Twelfth Dragon starts as a gruff, no-nonsense Avenger with a penchant for fire magic, but through her time spent with the Twelfth Griffin, a laid-back, easy-going roguish type, she softens. Something similar has been happening with the two main protagonists. Both start being driven by a need for revenge against the cult, but there's also a lot of fun, playful banter and even some pretty decent romantic tension between the two by the later levels of the game. I don't think the see-everything-after-the-fact method of telling a story works for a lot of it. There are a few things it does pretty well. At the Reliquary in Lost Sasad, we finally confront the twins. Or at least one of them. The boss fight here is probably the most interesting in the game mechanically. The boss has a powerful ranged attack that can be dodged, while also being fast enough to chase you. It still dies pretty easily if you're prepared, but unlike most of the other bosses, it hits a nice sweet spot for challenge versus how much health it has. Right after the boss fight, the villains even manage to take the hero by surprise by setting a trap on the reliquary and stealing the gems that give the dragon their power. These gems are also the thing that keeps bringing us back every time we die, so it's honestly refreshing to see a villain adapt to a hero's powers. Oh yeah, Shax is also alive again somehow, but if that ever got an explanation, I kind of missed it. Griffin manages to free us and gives us her gems so we can finish the fight right before she stabs us to get us out of prison. Once we figure out she's been captured by the surviving twin, we head off to Sodentrod to save her. Like the gutter from Dark Souls 2, Sodentrod is an area that's just perfectly named. It's an awful swamp region that reminds me more than a little of the last time I was in Louisiana, and for most of its runtime, it's one of the weakest levels in the game. There are no new enemies, and even the environment isn't as varied as it needs to be to keep large parts of the level from being boring. However, there is some great writing in this level. When you first meet the twins, they do the obligatory evil twin thing of finishing each other's sentences, and now that there's only one of them, the surviving twin is having trouble stringing a coherent thought together. You watch through the flashbacks as she struggles with it right up until the time she snaps and starts draining the life from her underlings. From that point, she slowly starts regaining lucidity until she becomes a genuinely dangerous opponent again. As distasteful and lazy as I find the incest thing, the flashbacks do a great job of depicting a character struggling to make up for the loss of half of themselves. As weird as it may sound, this might actually be the best writing in the game. That gets immediately followed by some much weaker writing as Griffin manages to escape capture, but rather than waiting around for five minutes for you to catch up, she follows the cult deeper into the swamp. The next mission, which, uh, thinking about it, I don't think has a proper name, so I'll call it Sodden Trotter, improves on the last in several ways. While it still takes place in a swamp, the level has some actual verticality that makes it a lot more interesting to traverse. It's also the first mission where the majority of the enemies you'll be fighting are demons, which is a mixed bag. Demons are easily the most interesting enemy type to fight, but if your spells aren't up to par, you're gonna struggle to survive. The level also finally answers the question of why the moon is broken, which is that at some point in the past the cult used a massive magical weapon to try to destroy the planet, but thanks to the sacrifice of a coalition army of every other kingdom, the damage was limited to the moon. And to top it all off, about half the level is you running through the remains of that weapon, and the battlefield where the, that last battle took place. Details like these really make me feel like I'm playing through a sequel to a game I've never heard of. Like there's some lichdom battle mage prequel out there about that first war, and I jumped into the follow-up with no background. Down in the ruins below the swamp, where the surviving twin and the griffin have been moving towards the whole mission, we also finally get the answer to the question of what happened to the previous dragon and griffin. Five years before the game started, they got this far before dying at the hands of a demon summoned by the king. If I approached it objectively, this raises a lot of awkward questions given how dragons are established to work in-game, but I was in invested enough in their story that I was honestly a little sad to see them go. What happens next, though, really irks me. We make it to the boss arena just in time to see the surviving twin kill the griffin. When I said five minutes earlier, I meant it. I'm all for killing characters off in a story if it serves a purpose and makes narrative sense. This does neither. All this does is just serve to be a cheap and transparent way of motivating the dragon to go after Shax, which, need I remind you, he already had a reason to do because that that man makes enemies every time he leaves his house 
in the morning. Fridging the griffin like this only makes whatever stories left in the game less interesting by removing the only other character that the main character was allowed to play off of. The boss fight isn't much to write home about, it goes down without much effort, and that means we're off to the final mission. The return to Dravasser commits what I would consider one of the cardinal sins of game design. It is the worst mission in the game. From a narrative standpoint, it's fairly simple. Your home city, the one that was asleep during the tutorial, is under siege by Shax and his minions, and the guards can't hold them back. Get in there and deal with the problem once and for all. How that translates into gameplay is an endless slog through some of the hardest fights in the main game, with few checkpoints in between. These fights also include the same lieutenant or godlike plus fast attack combo tentacle demons that seem to have about 300,000 health at least six times. It wouldn't be so bad if your spells hit harder, but in my playthrough the strongest spell I had access to did about 20,000 damage with proper setup. That means that each time I fought that enemy I had to land about 45 hits against something that would kill me if I made even a few small mistakes. Final missions are supposed to be a test of everything you've learned up to that point in the game, but I can't help but feel like like Glitched and Battle Mage pushed its combat system too far in uninteresting ways, and this final mission just feels like stumbling at the finish line. And then you get to the final boss, and that stumble turns into a full-on faceplant. Shax is the final boss, naturally, but he's in his demon form. The form behaves like a tentacle demon, except he can also summon up to six of the hitscan lightning demons with a pile of modifiers, cause high damage circle AoEs on the ground like it's suddenly in an MMO, and make clones of himself that can teleport to you from anywhere in the arena. It's definitely one of the hardest final bosses I've beaten in a game, but it wasn't challenging in a fun way. And to top it all off, I have no idea if my experience is accurate. I could just have been underleveled due to the random nature of how the game drops items. The bit of the post game I'd played ended up dropping components that were at least two levels higher than what I had at the end of the game, so it's certainly possible. If you've beaten this game yourself, I'd love to hear your experience with this final fight. In the meantime, I'm going to file it in the was never playtested file and move on. After Shax dies for good this time, the game ends with a to be continued that actually had me laughing. Our character finally got their revenge, though it cost them just about everything, and yet the game makes it clear that nothing is resolved. This would be fine if we were ever going to get a sequel, but from what I can tell the devs are no longer in business, their website is still up, but it's advertising a game that got abandoned in early access about four years ago, so who knows. Uh, fun fact though, while I was researching for this video, I stumbled across the fact that the story lead for this game was also the design director for FNAF Security breach. Now, it is possible that some of the lingering plot threads get resolved in the post game. In a move that's somewhat rare these days, once you beat the game you can take on dozens of optional challenges to keep improving your character. I have no idea if you ever actually confront the king there, and quite frankly, I was tired enough of the combat at the end that I didn't care to find out. The first challenge did have me running backwards through part of the Zasad level, and I did think that was a nice way to reuse some existing content. If the combat really clicks for you, you, I'm sure there's a decent amount of fun to be had here. So, at the end of it all, was Lichdom Battle Mage worth it? In short, no. This game had some really good ideas with the spellcrafting system and the characters being notable standouts. Unfortunately, it's held back by the exhausting combat, the unfinished story, and of course, the spellcrafting system. Ultimately, I really support the idea of a game like Lichdom Battle Mage existing. I just don't think this is it. Anyway, that's all the time that we have for today. If you have any suggestions for another game for me to take a look at, either as a game review or an MMO travelogue, feel free to leave it down in the comments. As always, thank you for watching to the end of the video. I hope you had as much fun with this one as I did making it, and I will catch you in the next one.